perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. It should be obvious to most of us that there is no such thing as a perfect church. And that is because there is no such thing as a perfect Christian. Every church then is a collection of imperfect Christians and therefore it is in itself imperfect. Secondly, there is no such thing as a perfect pastor. Everyone is imperfect. They all fall short of the absolute standard of holiness that God has set. So, if there is no such thing as a perfect Christian, or a perfect pastor, or a perfect church, and no individual or group of individuals can be anything that Jesus desires, is it at all possible to be faithful, to be obedient, to be diligent, and to please the Lord Jesus as a congregation? It is possible to be a church that the Lord blesses because that church is genuinely faithful to Him, and that is the case of this little church in Philadelphia in Asia Minor. The biblical city of Philadelphia was located about 45 kilometers southeast of the city of Sardis. It was the youngest of the seven churches whose churches are addressed in these letters in Revelation. This church in Philadelphia is unique among the seven churches because it is the only church that the Lord Jesus registers no complaint against. This apparently is the church that delighted Christ. Here is a little historical background. Philadelphia was founded about 150 BC by King Attalus of Pergamum, whose nickname was Philadelphus, which means lover of a brother. This king was known for the admiration and love that he had for his brother Eumenes, and he named this city in honor of him. One feature about the city was that it was plagued by earthquakes, and was devastated by an earthquake in 17 AD, along with Sardis and several other cities in that area. Most of the other cities recovered rather quickly from the disasters, but the aftershocks continued in Philadelphia for quite a number of years, with the result that the people had to flee the city repeatedly. Tiberius Caesar helped Philadelphia to recover from the earthquake, and out of gratitude the city changed its name to Neo-Caesarea, meaning New Caesar, and for a while it bore that name. These historical facts have a connection to the promises contained in the Lord Jesus' letter the church in Philadelphia. The letter to Philadelphia starts in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. The way Jesus presents himself to this church is very unusual. In the six other letters, he uses symbols to describe himself that come directly from the vision that John had of him in chapter 1. That is covered in episode 19 of Journey Through the Scriptures. In this letter, Jesus makes no reference to that vision. He instead uses other titles to describe himself. He tells them plainly who he is and what he does. Who he is is the Holy One and the True One. Jesus is the Holy One. He is morally perfect. His character is without flaw or blemish. This can refer to no one other than God, and that, of course, is Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church and is the author of the letter. This is God himself. Jesus also is the true one. The Greek word for true here is not the word als, which means a true statement. It is the word althenos, which means authentic or real, as opposed to the false or the counterfeit. In other words, he is the true God, not the false one, and Jesus is God. He is the holy and true God in person. He is perfect in his righteousness, and he is true in his character and all he says. Now, what he does is, he holds the key of David. This is a reference to an incident that is recorded in Isaiah 22 verses 15 to 22. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to the steward, to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, What have you to do here, and whom have you here, that you have cut out here a tomb for yourself, you who cut out a tomb on the height, and carve a dwelling for yourself in the rock? Behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently, O you strong man. He will seize firm hold on you, and whirl you around and around, 
and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There you shall die, and there shall be your glorious chariots, you shame of your master's house. I will thrust you from your office, and you will be pulled down from your station. In that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Apparently in the days of Hezekiah the king, there was a member of the king's court whose name was Shebna. He had been caught using his position to benefit himself, and as a result, God pronounced this very descriptive and unusual judgment against him. It was a prediction that he would be sent into Babylon. He would be replaced by a godly man named Eliakim. And God gives to this man a very special blessing in Isaiah 22 verses 22. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. For the church in Philadelphia, Jesus refers back to that passage in Isaiah and applies it to himself. He says, I am the one who shuts and no one can open, and opens and no one can shut. Jesus' will cannot be opposed. He governs all the events of history on earth. He will open some doors and he will close other doors. The doors that he opens, no one can shut, and the doors that he shuts, no one can open. In Revelation 3 verses 8, Jesus tells the church how he will use this power to open and shut. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. To a church like the one at Philadelphia, the Lord says he will open doors of ministry and service, and no one can shut them. The Apostle Paul experienced this in his second missionary journey when he tried to go into the province of Asia to preach the gospel, but was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. This was a shut door. Then he tried to go into Bithynia on the southern shore of the Black Sea, but was also not allowed by the Lord, which was another shut door. Acts 16 verses 6 to 7 says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go on to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. But when Paul came to Troas, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia, and he learned that the Lord Jesus had opened a door for him into Europe. Paul's commitment to enter that open door changed the entire history of the whole Western civilization since that time. It was an open door of tremendous significance which the Lord had opened for Paul. So, if we are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Lord can open doors in our country which have been closed for decades. In many translations, the words of verse 8, I know that you have little strength, is not what the original Greek text says, because there is no word used in Greek which can be translated as, I know. What it literally says is, because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The church has been given the reasons why the Lord opened the door for them. What the original Greek actually says is, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut because you have little power and have kept my word and not denied my name. This should teach us all something very important. It says that an open door is given when the church fulfills the conditions that allow it to move through that door once it has been opened. The most important amongst those conditions is that the church must discover the power of the Spirit. It is spiritual power the Lord is talking about, not the little power of the people or the church itself. It is power, power obtained by faith, by expecting God to act. Jesus knows we do not have the power to change the world. He is satisfied if we only give love and meet the needs of our neighbor. What should really happen in any church like Philadelphia is that individuals in the church sense that God can do something. They look for an opportunity, a need to appear, and when they respond, a door opens for continued service, which may grow even wider so others may enter with them. So it is our prerogative to act in faith and go where God is opening a door. Ephesians 2 verses 10 says, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. This should be the most inspiring verse in the New Testament. By the way, the word workmanship can also be translated as masterpiece. The Amplified Bible, one of my favorite translations, uses the word masterpiece. This is why you have been made a Christian, that you might do good works, which are deeds of help, mercy, and kindness. This is what each member of the church is capable of doing. We are created for good works. This verse goes on to say, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you are confronted with a need, it may appear rather insignificant, a fairly minor problem. But when you respond to that need, however, it becomes an open door. Ministry may grow out of it which will challenge and encourage and bless you as you go on. Notice what Jesus says to this church at Philadelphia. You have a little power. This highlights the fact that most churches do not realize the potential they have for ministry. Each one of us listening to this podcast who knows Christ has been given spiritual gifts and have been commissioned by God to use those gifts to bless people and meet their needs. Yet how many of us will actually use those gifts that God has given to us? That is why the Lord Jesus says to this church in Philadelphia, You have some power, but not much. He is hoping they will realize their potential for ministry. When we look at each of these seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor, we should see that the Lord tells us that it is not the biggest church, nor the one with a name and reputation, that are necessarily in the best spiritual shape. When Christ measures or gauges a church's spiritual life, He doesn't look at size, power, or influence. He doesn't look at wealth and growth. When Christ measures or weighs a church's spiritual life, He doesn't look at outward appearances. What Christ looks at is the heart. What Christ looks for is spiritual wealth. We need to remember that the presence of the Holy Spirit is promised to each church without any condition whatsoever. When we know Christ, the Spirit comes to live within our hearts and to reside there. But the power of the Spirit is given only to those churches who learn to keep His word and do not deny His name. Those two things are central in the ministry of every church. Firstly, there must be the Word. God always plants His Word at the heart of His church. The Word is not just for the leadership, but everybody in the church must know God's Word. Beyond the Word is the Lord Himself. It is the Word of God which enables us to know the character of Jesus, to have fellowship with Him, and to not deny that character in our lives and seek to conform our behavior to His life. With those qualities, one can enter into the open doors which Christ gives to the church. Revelation 3 verses 9 says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Secondly, to a responsive church, Jesus will use his power to open and shut, and to make their enemies respect them and openly acknowledge God's blessing upon them. The phrase, the synagogue of Satan, is also mentioned in the letter to the persecuted church at Smyrna. The Lord Jesus himself, during his earthly ministry, continually confronted the Pharisees who claimed to be Abraham's descendants, but were not. Jesus said to them in John 8 verses 44, You are of your father, the devil. In the city of Philadelphia, Jesus refers to this Jewish opposition as the synagogue of Satan. But what will cause this synagogue of Satan to come at last and bow before the church and acknowledge God's blessing upon them? When the church responds to the opposition and hostility with love and with obvious knowledge of God, which these Jews do not possess, even though they have the scriptures, then they would come at last and acknowledge God's blessing on the church at Philadelphia. The third way in which our Lord will exercise the power of opening and shutting is given to us in the amazing promise of Revelation 3 verses 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Again, the correct translation should be 
since you have kept my word of patient endurance. The Greek word upomenes, or a patient enduring, is a reference to Jesus' own patient endurance during his own earthly ministry. To paraphrase what Jesus is saying, since you have learned to wait like that, since you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. The hour of trial is a clear reference to what Jesus himself calls in Matthew 24 the Great Tribulation. This will be the worst time of distress and bloodshed that the world has ever seen. This Great Tribulation is particularly sent to test those who dwell upon the earth. This does not mean the residence of this planet. The literal word used here in the Greek is tabernacled. This is a reference to an attitude and state of mind. It is referring to those who live as though this life is all that there is, who are materialistically minded, who live upon the earth and live only for the things of earth. The promise that Jesus gives to the church is specifically that it will be delivered from that hour of trial. Actually, the word is not from, but out of. To be delivered out of. Not just the trial, but out of the very time of the trial. This is one of the clearest promises in the Bible of the departure or snatching away of the church before the Great Tribulation begins, that Paul refers to in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 17. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so that we will always be with the Lord. If we look prophetically from the perspective of Christian history, this Church of Philadelphia mirrors the great evangelical awakenings of the 18th and 19th centuries, which began in England as the movement which we call the Puritan movement. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, was one of the Puritans. John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, was another Puritan. During this time, John Wesley and George Whitfield's preachings brought great revival in both England and America. The great evangelists like Charles Spurgeon, Charles Finney and D. L. Moody also emerged during this time. There was also a great time of revival in the missionary field in Africa by David Livingston and Hudson Taylor in China as the doors of opportunity to minister were opened by God. Jesus' exhortation for the church in Philadelphia is given in Revelation 3 verses 11 to 13. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Once again, we have a reminder of Jesus' wonderful promise. I am coming soon. Many skeptics will say that this letter was written almost 2,000 years ago and that the church has been expecting him ever since, but he still has not returned. The answer to this promise must be seen in relationship to its context. In the previous verses, Jesus had just been describing the time of the Great Tribulation. He also describes this period very clearly in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. In this passage in Matthew, we have a terrible picture of the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, stars falling from the heaven, and men's hearts failing as they look in fear on the things coming to pass upon the earth. It is in relationship to that event that Jesus says he is coming soon. Jesus gave context to this promise in Luke 21 verses 28 where he says, Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. When Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown, he is promising that it will become even more difficult to be a Christian, as hostility increases and the world becomes more and more secular. Therefore, we must be careful that we do not give up and take on worldly attitudes and worldly pursuits. We should never allow a desire for status, prestige, fame, and the things that the world lusts for to become central in our thinking. Hold on to what you have, says Jesus, 
because there is a danger that someone may take your crown. What is this crown? It is not a reference to the loss of salvation. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 to 15 explains it. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What the crown is speaking of is our opportunity for service in eternity. The reward which is offered is communion with God in worship and service. In other words, do not lose the opportunities you have. Possess them, and you will receive a reward. There are two promises given to the ones who conquer and who hold on to what they have in verse 11 and 12. The first is found in verse 12, where Jesus promises to make them a pillar in God's temple. A pillar is always a symbol of strength and permanence. They will be someone who holds things up. In Galatians 2 verses 9, Peter, James and John are described as pillars of the church. The church rested upon them in that they were imparting guidance and knowledge to Christians. In the Jerusalem temple there were two great pillars in front of the building, one called Yachin, which means established or permanent, and the other Boaz, or strength. Pillars are thus symbols of strength and permanence. Never again will he leave it, Jesus promises. Have you noticed that when you see or visit ancient ruins, that often all that is left standing are the pillars? This promise of Jesus to never go out again is a reference to the experience of these Philadelphians who had to frequently flee the city because of the earthquakes and tremors that occurred frequently. When you work for me, says Jesus, you will reach a place where you will not have to ever go out again. This is a picture of security, permanence and strength. The second promise is also found in Revelation 3 verses 12. Three names will be written on the overcomer. A change of names would be significant to the Philadelphians because that city changed its name twice in its history. It called itself Neo-Caesarea when Tiberius helped to rebuild it, and later on in honor of Vespasian, one of the Flavian emperors, it changed its name to Flavia. It was later named back to Philadelphia. In the biblical sense, names revealed the character of the name. The first name is the name of my God. This is a promise that believers will be made to be more like God. Godliness is a shortened form of the word God-likeness. The purpose of the Spirit in our lives is to make us godly. As you grow and mature as a Christian, you ought to be a little easier to live with, more patient, more compassionate, understanding of others, and mature in your judgment. In other words, you will manifest the nature of the one whose name you have, that is God. The second name is the name of the city of my God. The last two chapters of Revelation give a description of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, a beautiful bride meeting her husband. Again, it is a picture of loving intimacy, the intimacy of a husband's love for his beautiful bride. The third name is, I will also write on him my new name. What name is that? Since a name symbolizes one's character, this must refer to the fact that when our Lord Jesus' work of redemption is finished, he will be given a new name. In Revelation 19 verses 12, we are told that when Jesus appears, he will have that new name written upon him. But it is a name that no man knows. When an angel appeared to Joseph and told him that Mary would bear a son, he said, You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Jesus is the redeeming name of our Lord. It means Yahweh or Jehovah saves. But when the work of redemption is finished and we are all with him in glory and God's work of saving and redeeming us is complete, Jesus will be given a new work to do. No one knows what it will be. It will be a new role. But here the church is promised a share in that new role. So finally we come again to our Lord's word of caution in verse 13. Like in all the rest of the letters, he who has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are we listening? We need to stop, look and listen and hear the Spirit. We need to think through these letters. We need to pay attention to them because they are spelling out our future destiny and that can be good or bad. The Holy One, the True One, Jesus, knew everything about this church and as I said in the beginning of this podcast, they were not perfect, but they were faithful. The result of this faithfulness was that He poured out Heaven's blessings on them. Jesus gave them opportunity to be the open door for the gospel. He promised to deliver them from their hour of testing and to come quickly, take them to heaven and give them everlasting blessings. This is the reward and crown of being a faithful church. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 26. Music